so we are finally coming to the end of the river. It's been a long road getting from there to here. It's been a long time, and I best stop now lest I be sued by CBS Paramount. But we are finally getting close to the place that the river gets its namesake, or perhaps the other way around. Leaf means damp, and the area that we call Leaf today was originally called Inverleaf, but let's deal with that later. Or perhaps never, I don't know. But first, let's talk about Bonnington. Bonnington today is one of those urban areas in the north of Edinburgh. It's certainly deep within Edinburgh, but not within the city centre. You can cycle there from Waverley in about 11 minutes according to Google Maps, which is pretty good. Now I'm starting to sound like an estate agent, so let's get straight to the point. To the northeast of the crossroads, there is what is now a nondescript area, but a quick look back in time shows something very interesting. A rail yard serving local mills, businesses and warehouses. All of this makes the urbanist in me sing with the links to the rail network, centrality of the location and the density. Density is great and this was a very good use of limited urban space. All of this might seem rather impractical to the modern eye, but we'll get into that rather quickly. Railways back in the past served the role lorries do today, so for large industries having a rail link was very, very handy, hence why so many industries had sidings and spurs. I would argue that railways were and still are better than lorries because unlike lorries, a train can carry a lot more freight. Indeed, for bulk freight, rail freight is still used. If you live on the West Coast Main Line or the Highland Main Line, you will likely see Tesco containers going up and down those lines. The rail yard had a dedicated freight station, something you definitely do not see anymore, but it also had direct rail access to the businesses it served. The businesses in 1894 included a paper mill, a manure factory, an ironworks, a tannery, corn and grain stores, a biscuit factory, an iron foundry, a sugar refinery, maltings, a wool warehouse, fleck mills, and a sawmill. There's one thing you might notice about the layout of the rails. They have very sharp turns, turns that you would not expect a normal standard gauge locomotive to be able to take. So let's talk about how that worked. So it's fairly common knowledge that trains cannot take too sharp a turn, meaning that railways usually have to be fairly straight and flat. This doesn't mean you can't have a bendy line, but it would mean that trains would have to slow down to a crawl. If you live in Fife and travel along the north of the Fife Circle, you are likely familiar with the curve north of Cowden Beef, where the train slows straight down. These curves are sharper than that. So let's talk about the locomotives that take these curves. So to take sharp curves, locomotives generally need something called a small wheel pace. The wheel pace is the area that the wheels touch the rails. A loco with a large wheel base would derail on sharp curves, which means the loco will not be too big and therefore not too powerful. There is a way around this, but we'll get into that later. So the locos that would have likely been working these rails would have been pug -like locomotives like the Caledonian Railway 264 class. In short, the local would look a little bit like Percy from Thomas the Tank Engine. This 040 would have been perfect for these small rail yards moving short distances with sharp turns. But Abby, I hear you shout because I have bugged every millimetre of this city. The trams are longer, how do they take sharp turns? Well, that is where we're going to get to a magical technology known as articulation. You may well know that modern day trams are a lot like worms in the sense that they're segmented into small sections. The bogies, the sets of wheels underneath the tram, are quite close together, meaning the wheels can take sharp turns too. This is not a new technology. Bogies on train carriages have been used for well over a century now. But what if I told you that there is a way that large steam locomotives can take sharp turns? And the answer lies, weirdly, in Wales. So in South Africa and Australia, the need to carry large loads on windy, narrow gauge railways led to a problem that resulted in the Garretts. 
these large articulated locomotives allowed large powerful engines to take sharp turns. Now, most of these were utilised in South Africa and Australia, but a lot of them found their way in preservation to Wales. Wales is famous for an gauge railways with sharp turns. Usually they worked fine with traditional locomotives, but the Welsh Highland Railway, when it was being rebuilt as a heritage line, struggled to find locomotives powerful enough to take these turns. That's when they found their flagship locomotives, the Garretts. Currently the WHR has five of them all in differing conditions, with two awaiting restoration, but they are icons of the railway. I have seen them in person and they almost thought they could pass for standard gauge locos. Recently, the Vale of Cradle Railway, which runs from Aberystwyth, acquired a Garrett from Switzerland. So there you have it, that's how you fit something you expect to be quite large in such a small area. We are finally reaching the end of the river and thus the Port of Leaf, which is the most historically significant part of our journey so far. But today I would like to concentrate on Leaf Dock specifically and how it developed. The docks have dragged the distance of the shore out to about a mile, obscuring the original landscape of Leaf. The original shoreline would have been somewhere around Commercial Street, just giving you an idea of the sheer amount of land that has basically been reclaimed from the fourth. All of this is pretty mad when you think about this. All this land that has basically been reclaimed from the river is now being used for flats, supermarkets and a shopping mall. As I said in the previous video, Leaf's ascendancy of the port came when the English took Berwick. Berwick in the past was Scotland's trade port for the continent, which back in the 13th century was rather important, as it is now despite the disagreements of the British political establishment. Until the advent of the railways, it was actually quicker to get to Amsterdam than it was to get to London. Despite being further away from the continent and on an estuary, Leaf was, in my frank opinion, a better choice for the port. It was, and dare I say is, much more defensible being on a fjord. It's closer to Edinburgh, and it's handily downriver from the coalfields in and around Clackmannanshire, which is likely why it saw its expansion into what it is today. The first incarnation of the docks was an anchorage at the mouth of the river, which eventually evolved into proper docks in the 17th century. These, however, were affected by the shifting sands in and around the area, which made life quite difficult for shipping. It was in the dying years of the 18th century that one John Rennie proposed to develop the docks some more to provide some reliable deep water for ships heading into Leith. His proposal was put into practice in 1800, where the docks as we know them now began to take shape, but even in 1849 they looked very different to what they do today. The docks were made up of three docks two near the shore and one to the north called the Victoria Docks. In that way the Victorians named everything after Queen Victoria. They were notably much smaller than today's docks. In fact, two of these docks are now filled in, so that's something to mull over. In 1880 the Albert and Edinburgh Docks were built, both of which remain today, and then in 1936 the Western Harbour was built. Leaf was a big grain port, with the port importing a quarter of a million tonnes of grain per annum in 1948. This would prove to be its peak and in the post-war years the port fell into decay becoming known as an area known for its crime. A redevelopment scheme in the 1990s saw the area redeveloped with many of its old docks filled in and built upon with shops, flats, the ocean terminal, pubs and nightclubs, as well as the Scottish Government offices, resulting in an area that people actually want to visit. It is even on the tourist trail of it being the home to the Royal Yacht Britannia, becoming her final home after retirement. And that, ladies, gents and all those in between the neighbour, is the Water of Leaf. It's been a long road getting from there to here, but I hope it was worth it. Now if you excuse me, I have to lie down after recording and editing all these videos and figure out what to do next.